Chapter 17 Randall Flagg, the dark man, strode south on US-51, listening to the night sounds that pressed close on both sides of this narrow road that would take him, sooner or later, out of Idaho and into Nevada. From Nevada, he might go anywhere. It was his country, and none knew or loved it better. He knew where the roads went, and he walked them at night. Now, an hour before dawn, he was somewhere between Grasmere and Riddle, west of Twin Falls, still north of the Duck Valley Reservation that spreads across two states. He walked rapidly, run down boot heels clocking against the paved surface of the road, and if car lights showed on the horizon, he faded back and back, down over the soft shoulder to the high grass, where the night bugs make their homes, and the car would pass him, the driver perhaps feeling a slight chill, as if he had driven through an air pocket, his sleeping wife and children stirring uneasily, as if all had been touched with a bad dream at the same instant. He walked south, south on US-51, the worn heels of his sharp-toed cowboy boots clocking on the pavement. A tall man with no age, in faded, pegged jeans and a denim jacket. His pockets were stuffed with 50 different kinds of conflicting literature. When this man handed you a tract, you took it no matter what the subject. The dangers of atomic power plants. The role played by the international Jewish cartel in the overthrow of friendly governments. The CIA. The Farm Workers Union. The Jehovah's Witnesses. If you could answer these 10 questions, yes, you have been saved. The blacks for militant equality. The code of the clan. He had them all. And more, too. There was a button on each breast of his denim jacket. On the right, a yellow smile face. On the left, a pig wearing a policeman's cap. The legend was written beneath in a semicircle. How's your pork? He moved on, not pausing, not slowing, but alive to the night. His eyes seemed almost frantic with the night's possibilities. There was a Boy Scouts of America knapsack on his back, old and battered. There was a dark hilarity in his face, and perhaps in his heart too, you would think. And you would be right. It was the face of a hatefully happy man. A face that radiated a horrible, handsome warmth. A face to make water glasses shatter in the hands of tired truck stop waitresses, to make small children crash their shrikes into board fences and then run wailing to their mommies with steak-shaped splinters sticking out of their knees. It was a face guaranteed to make barroom arguments over batting averages turn bloody. He moved on south, somewhere on US-51 between Grasmere and Riddle, now closer to Nevada. Soon he would camp and sleep the day away, waking up as evening drew on. He would read as his supper cooked over a small, smokeless campfire. It didn't matter what. Words from some battered and coverless paperback novel. And after supper, he would walk, walk south on this excellent two-lane highway, cutting through this godforsaken wilderness, watching and smelling and listening as the climate grew more arid, strangling everything down to sagebrush and tumbleweed, watching as the mountains began to poke out of the earth like dinosaur bones. By dawn tomorrow or the day after that, he would pass into Nevada, striking Oihi first and then Mountain City, and in Mountain City, there was a man named Christopher Bradenton who would see that he had a clean car. With a car, the country would come alive in all its glorious possibilities. 
a body politic with its network of roads embedded in its skin like marvelous capillaries. Ready to take him. The dark speck of foreign matter. Anywhere. He hammered along arms swinging by his sides. He was known, well known, along the highways in hiding that are traveled by the poor and the mad. By the professional revolutionaries. By those who have been taught to hate so well. That their hate shows on their faces like hair lips. And they are unwelcome except by others like them. Who welcome them to cheap rooms with slogans and posters on the walls. To basements where lengths of sawed-off pipe are held in padded vices, while they are stuffed with high explosives, to back rooms where lunatic plans are laid, to kill a cabinet member, to kidnap the child of a visiting dignitary, or to break into a boardroom meeting of standard oil with grenades and machine guns and murder in the name of the people. He was down there, and even the maddest of them could only look at his dark and grinning face at an oblique angle. The women he took to bed with him, even if they had reduced intercourse to something as casual as getting a snack from the refrigerator, accepted him with a stiffening of the body, a turning away of the countenance. Sometimes they accepted him with tears. They took him the way they might take a ram with golden eyes or a black dog. And when it was done, they were cold. So cold, it seemed impossible they could ever be warm again. When he walked into a meeting, the hysterical babble ceased. The backbiting, recriminations, accusations, the ideological rhetoric. For a moment there would be dead silence and they would start to turn to him and then turn away as if he had come to them with some old and terrible engine of destruction cradled in his arms. Something a thousand times worse than the plastic explosive made in the basement labs of renegade chemistry students or the black market arms obtained from some greedy army post supply sergeant. It seemed that he had come to them with a device gone rusty with blood and packed for centuries in the cosmoline of screams, but now ready again, carried to their meeting like some infernal gift, a birthday cake with nitroglycerin candles. And when the talk began again, it would be rational and disciplined. As rational and disciplined as madmen can make it, and things would be agreed upon. He rocked along, his feet easy in the boots, which were comfortably sprung in all the right places. His feet in these boots were old lovers. Christopher Bradenton in Mountain City knew him as Richard Fry. Bradenton was a conductor on one of the underground railway systems by which fugitives moved. Half a dozen different organizations, from the weathermen, to the Guevara Brigade saw that Bradenton had money. He was a poet who sometimes taught free university classes or traveled in the western states of Utah, Nevada, and Arizona, speaking to high school English classes, stunning middle-class boys and girls, he hoped, with the news that poetry was an unquiet corpse. He was in his mid-40s now, but Bradenton had been dismissed from one California college 15 years ago for getting too chummy with the SDS. He had been busted in the Great Chicago Pig Convention of 1968, formed his ties to one radical group after another, first embracing the craziness of these groups, then being swallowed whole. The dark man walked and smiled. Bradenton represented just one end of one conduit, and there were thousands of them. The pipes the crazies moved through carrying their books and bombs. The pipes were interconnected, the signposts disguised, but readable to the initiate. In New York, he was known as Robert Frank. 
and his claim that he was a black man had never been disputed, although his skin was very light. He and a black veteran of Nam, the black vet had more than enough hate to make up for his missing left leg, had offed six cops in New York and New Jersey. In Georgia, he was Ramsey Forrest, a distant descendant of Nathan Bedford Forrest. And in his white sheet, he had participated in two rapes, a castration, and the burning of a nigger shantytown. But that had been long ago, in the early 60s, during the first civil rights surge. He sometimes thought that he might have been born in that strife. He certainly could not remember much that had happened to him before that. Except that he came originally from Nebraska, and that he had once attended high school classes with a red-haired, bandy-legged boy named Charles Starkweather. He remembered the civil rights marches of 1960 and 61 better. The beatings, the night rides, the charges that had exploded as if some miracle inside them had grown too big to be contained. He remembered drifting down to New Orleans in 1962 and meeting a demented young man who was handing out tracts, urging America to leave Cuba alone. The man had been a certain Mr. Oswald, and he had taken some of Oswald's tracts, and he still had a couple, very old and crumpled in one of his many pockets. He had sat on a hundred different committees of responsibility. He had walked in demonstrations against the same dozen companies on a hundred different college campuses. He wrote the questions that most discomfited those in power when they came to lecture, but he never asked the questions himself because they might have seen his grinning, burning face as some cause for alarm and fled from the podium. Likewise, he never spoke at rallies because the microphones would scream with hysterical feedback and circuits would blow. But he had written speeches for those who did speak, and on several occasions those speeches had ended in riots, overturned cars, student strike votes, and violent demonstrations. For a while in the early 70s, he had been acquainted with a man named Donald DeFries, and had suggested that DeFries take the name Sin Q. He had helped lay plans that resulted in the kidnapping of an heiress, and it had been he who suggested that the heiress be made crazy instead of ransomed. He had left the small Los Angeles house where DeFries and the others had fried, not 20 minutes before the police had arrived. He slunk away up the street, his bulging and dusty boots clocking on the pavement, a fiery grin on his face that made mothers grab up their children and pull them into the house. And later, when a few tattered remnants of the group were swept up, all they knew was that there had been someone else associated with the group. Maybe someone important, maybe just a hanger on. A man of no age. A man who was sometimes called the walking dude. He strode on at a steady, ground-eating pace. Two days ago, he had been in Laramie, Wyoming, part of an eco dodge group that had blown a power station. Today, he was on US-51 between Grasmere and Riddle, on his way to Mountain City. Tomorrow, he would be somewhere else, and he was happier than he had ever been because he stopped. Because something was coming. He could feel it. Almost taste it on the night air. He could taste it. A sooty, hot taste that came from everywhere. As if God was planning a cookout and all of civilization was going to be the barbecue. His time of transfiguration was at hand. He was going to be born for the second time. He was going to be squeezed out of the laboring cunt of some great sand-colored beast that even now lay in the throes of its contractions, its legs moving slowly as the birth blood gushed, 
its sun-hot eyes glaring into the emptiness. He had been born when times changed, and the times were going to change again. It was in the wind, in the wind of this soft Idaho evening. It was almost time to be reborn, he knew. Why else could he suddenly do magic? When Stephen King published that work back in 1978, it was a time when a lot of those names and references would have been fresher on the minds of many Americans. So for the present moment, I would like to expand on some of them. The presentation of Randall Flagg in this story is of a creature created in a uniquely American time with a uniquely American perspective. He's nurtured by our own disunion as a country and a society at that time. And so he is attracted to certain kinds of people and groups that I will go into right now. And then I will go into a little bit more about Flagg himself afterwards. The SDS was Students for a Democratic Society, founded in 1960. It was a uh, revolutionary youth movement associated with the new left of the 60s. Part of the same cultural movement as the more extreme Weather Underground, which became the Weathermen. Named uh, so for a Bob Dylan lyric about not needing a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Historically, they were associated with black power, communism, black nationalism, anti-imperialism, and in general, the New Left movement of the 60s and 70s. I will read an excerpt of their Wikipedia entry that references the National Weathermen Convention in 1969 in Chicago. <clears throat> At this convention, the Weathermen faction of the Students for a Democratic Society, planned for October 8 through 11, as a national action built around John Jacobs' slogan, Bring the War Home. The national action grew out of a resolution drafted by Jacobs and introduced at the October 1968 SDS National Council meeting in Boulder, Colorado. Note for Stan fans. The resolution entitled, The Elections Don't Mean Shit, Vote Where the Power Is, our power is in the street, and adopted by the council was prompted by the success of the Democratic National Convention protests, more on those in a minute, in August 1968, and reflected Jacob's strong advocacy of direct action. As part of the National Action Staff, Jacobs was an integral part of the planning for what quickly came to be called Four Days of Rage. For Jacobs, the goal of the Days of Rage was clear. Quote, Weathermen would shove the war down their dumb, fascist throats and show them, while we were at it, how much better we were than them, both tactically and strategically, as a people. In an all-out civil war over Vietnam and other fascist U.S. imperialism, we were going to bring the war home, turn the imperialists' war into a civil war, in Lenin's words, and we were going to kick ass. The entry continues, in July 1939, 30 members of the Weathermen leadership traveled to Cuba and met with North Vietnamese representatives to gain from their revolutionary experience. The North Vietnamese requested armed political action in order to stop the U.S. government's war in Vietnam. Subsequently, they accepted funding, training, recommendations on tactics and slogans from Cuba and perhaps explosives as well. The Guevara Brigade, I cannot find specific notes on for a reference to an American association in the 1960s or 70s. There are Canadian organizations that have sprung up in the early 2000s that take that name. Clearly not the ones that Stephen King is referencing. But it wouldn't be hard to guess what a 60s or 70s organization referring to themselves in America as the Guevara Brigade would be organizing itself around as far as the ideology. Most likely communist, socialist, Marxist, workers' rights left-wing revolutionary activists. On to Charles Starkweather, who, in 1958, went on a killing spree with his 14-year-old girlfriend. Charles was 19, and Carol Ann Fugit's parents didn't much like the fact that those two were together with the big age difference between them. So Charles shot her parents and strangled her toddler half-sister before they both went on a killing spree on the highway, basically ending the lives of everyone they came across. 
This clearly was the inspiration for movies like Nebraska, Natural Born Killers. Donald DeFreeze, who later changed his name to Sing Q, was the head of the SLA, the United Federated Forces of the Symbionese Liberation Army, a left-wing militant organization mostly active between 73 and 75. They committed some bank robberies, two murders, and uh, other acts of violence around the Oakland or San Francisco area. In 1973, in Oakland, two members of the SLA killed a school superintendent named Marcus Foster and wounded his deputy, Robert Blackburn. As the two men left an Oakland school board meeting, they were shot with hollow point bullets filled with cyanide. Apparently, this is because Foster was a fascist for wanting to introduce identification cards into Oakland schools. Later, the SLA would kidnap American heiress Patty Hearst. She was the heir to the William Randolph Hearst newspaper Empire and Fortune. He himself built that empire on the money from his father, George Hearst, who was a mining baron. Throughout the process of the creation of both of their empires in their separate industries, they excelled at destroying the lives of many smaller, weaker competitors in the same businesses. Just like when the president's daughter is kidnapped by Cuervo Jones in the classic cinematic treat Escape from L.A. by John Carpenter, Patty Hearst was eventually seen in photographs uh, wearing the same uniform as the other members of the SLA, posing with firearms and claiming to be on board with their ideology, going so far as to take part in the armed robbery of a San Francisco bank in April 1974. She would eventually be sentenced to seven years in prison for her involvement in the robbery, but that sentence would later be commuted by Jimmy Carter, with the crime itself pardoned eventually by Bill Clinton. The SLA would move its operations down to Los Angeles and eventually get ratted out by someone who was the mother of a woman staying with them. This would be just a month after the bank robbery. The LAP tracked them down in a house surrounded them, and called for everyone to come out of the building. One old man and a small child emerged. The man said there was no one else inside. The child told the cops that there were a lot of people with a lot of guns in there. So a firefight ensued, both sides shooting back and forth at each other, and the LAPD lobbing a whole lot of tear gas inside the house. It's postulated that one of the many, many canisters of tear gas might have flared up against a curtain or something else flammable in the house, which started a blaze going inside. And eventually, a lot of the SLA members died of smoke inhalation or burns and gunshot wounds from the LAPD. The coroner's report shows Donald DeFreeze having died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the side of the head. I'm talking about this in greater detail than the others because it is sort of a landmark case in American crime history of the thousands of rounds fired at the cops by the SLA with their M1 carbines that were converted to be automatic. None of them hit any police officers or civilians or anyone else. Total of 9,000 rounds were fired by both sides together. Uh, 4,000 by the SLA, 5,000 by the police. To this day, it is one of the largest recorded shootouts in American crime history. Also fun to note is that the creation of the SLA's seven-headed cobra symbol was uh, very similar to a Hydra. Probably nothing to do with Marvel Comics, but still. Hydra was created by Marvel in 1965. Um, the SLA, obviously, about eight years later. Uh, it was a symbol that was supposed to represent different principles of Kwanzaa. Uh, the Swahili words for these seven principles were translated into unity, self-determination, collective work and responsibility, cooperative economics, purpose, creativity, and faith. Gotta love good marketing. By the way, if you're curious, you can listen to recordings of SingQ on YouTube. The Ramones wrote a song called Judy's a punk back in 1976, a couple years after, or a year or so after all this happened. Uh, there's a reference in there to these two characters, Jackie and Judy, 
going to Frisco to join the SLA. No, I don't know why. Oh, I don't know why. Perhaps they'll die. Oh, yeah. Stephen King is a huge Ramones fan. He wrote the liner notes for a tribute to the Ramones that Rob Zombie produced back in the uh, early 2000s. He also put the song Sheena is a Punk Rocker prominently in the movie Pet Cemetery with the truck driver that runs over the little kid early on in the film, listening to it and singing along. He hung out with Joy Ramone while he was still alive and even referenced in his own book on writing that he foresees himself being married to his wife Tabitha for the rest of their natural lives as long as they can keep loving each other and dancing to the Ramones' Gaba Gaba Hey. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what I remember. The 1968 Chicago Pig Convention, named in this chapter, is a reference to the Democratic National Convention of 1968 in Chicago, Illinois, which was fraught with violence um, between police officers and protesters at the time. There are many, many avenues for you to choose if you would like to read up on the impact of that event in our national consciousness, especially for journalists and politicians. It was a real clash of young ideology and revolutionary thinking and protest with old school police tactics pushed to a more militarized level. It was indicative of a lot of smaller clashes that were happening in major metropolitan cities around the country with youth going up against sort of the old guard politically and legally out in the streets and being brutally beaten down for their efforts. Because quite frankly, the cops had never had to deal with a situation like that before, and their reaction was one of savage, savage brutality that most Americans probably didn't expect. But it was also an indication that politically the Democratic Party could not stay unified or on track, with younger voices crying out for more revolutionary leadership while the older, more established politicians were just trying to stay the course and keep the kids quiet. Again, more and more themes of Randall Flagg's attraction to disunion through the people he associates with, especially when it comes to communities of people that are gathered together for the same ideological reasons, supposedly. And then that leaves Lee Harvey Oswald, which you can read a billion books about and watch 80 gazillion documentaries about in your own time. Obviously, Stephen King is a big researcher of the Kennedy assassination and the life of Lee Harvey Oswald. If you want more of his perspective on Oswald and the JFK assassination, you can certainly read 112263, which is a really good book. Very entertaining. Or maybe watch the series. With James Franco, I haven't uh, gotten through it myself yet. I'm still trying to figure out if the uh, Bill Skarsgård character from Castle Rock is going to be Randall Flagg. And now I've just dated this whole recording. What are you going to do? Committees of responsibility mentioned in this chapter were things that uh, sprung up all over the country in the late to post-Vietnam War era. Their purpose and goal was to physically rehabilitate wounded children of the Vietnam conflict from Vietnam, as well as educate them and perhaps integrate them into a new life in America. And finally, Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate general during the American Civil War. He was uh, given the nickname Wizard of the Saddle for being such an expert cavalry leader. And in April 1864... Troops under his command massacred a group of Union troops who had already surrendered, most of them being black soldiers. In 1867, he joined the Ku Klux Klan two years after it was founded and was elected its first Grand Wizard. Under his leadership during the elections of 1868, the Klan suppressed voting rights of blacks and Republicans in the South through various methods of violence and intimidation. In 1869... He got so frustrated that the KKK was simply not organized or effective enough for his taste that he withdrew from the organization formally. And that's what I wanted to cover historically about this chapter. 
Further thoughts on Randall Flagg. My recollection of what Stephen King originally said about him as far as how he looks was that he was supposed to be kind of plain but not unattractive. But when they filmed the Stand miniseries in 1990, he recorded a commentary track for that where he talked about requesting specifically that they cast a man who looked like he would be right off the cover of a romance novel. I remember in that commentary, him using that phrase, that uh, Flag is the voice of our disunion as a people, and that he loves America, and that he actually loves people because they're so much fun. He's always on the outside looking in. He's always apart from us. The portrayal of Flag by Matthew McConaughey in the Dark Tower film was a bit one note. He didn't seem to be having a whole lot of fun. He didn't seem to have a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And it shows how dangerous it is when a character like this gets in the hands of Hollywood writers. Hopefully we'll see some more layered portrayals of him in the future. Anyway, I don't want to ruin anything for you, but if you're intrigued about the character, you can look up all kinds of lists online that explain which books he pops up in. Personally, I think that he was created for The Stand and then retroactively molded into the character from The Dark Tower that was originally introduced as Walter. I also think that Stephen King likes writing similar characters like him, just like in uh, Storm of the Century, and saw the opportunity to make Roland's greatest nemesis sort of a callback to The Stand in Wizard and Glass when they end up in Topeka, Kansas in another reality. If you'd like to read more about Randall Flagg in a different setting, a more fairy tale like medieval setting, uh, check out The Eyes of the Dragon by Stephen King, in which he still retains all of his cheeky, manipulative evil, but entirely removed from our modern American sensibilities. To me, it's another indication of what a great character he is, no matter what the setting is or what sort of stage of his various levels of life or rebirth he is in the middle of. So, thanks for joining me for all this. I hope you got something out of it. If you don't, I don't care. Please be nice. I'm not creating a goddamn YouTube empire off this. So, I don't care if you like and subscribe. Have a nice day, if nothing else. And... No, that's it. Nothing else.